Hi guys, today I'll be discussing Chemistry IGCSC, uh, paper 4-1 May-June 2022 series. And this paper is 1 hour and 15 minutes long and it's 80 marks. Okay, we'll start with question 1. A list of substances is shown. Answer the question using the list of substances. Each substance may be used once, more than once, or not at all. State which of the substances is a reactant in photosynthesis. So photosynthesis, the equation goes like uh, carbon dioxide plus water, you get glucose plus oxygen. Okay, so a reactant will be one of these two. Since you don't have water, the answer has to be carbon dioxide. Okay, the main constituent of bauxite. So when we see bauxite, bauxite is actually the ore of aluminum. So whenever you see bauxite, it has to re be related to aluminum. Okay, so therefore the main constituent of bauxite has to be the only aluminum compound in this list of substances, which is aluminum oxide. Okay, so next question, uh, which are two sub two products of fermentation. So fermentation is when you get yeast and you put it in a no oxygen environment. Okay, you don't have oxygen. So therefore, you produce ethanol and carbon dioxide. Okay. It's a form of respiration, okay? Anaerobic respiration. So therefore, the answer has to be ethanol and carbon dioxide, okay? Use as a fuel. So, uh, we think of fuel in the list. Remember that all alcohols can be burned, okay? They can combust. And therefore, alcohols can be used as fuel. So therefore, for D, answer is ethanol, okay? Uh, Substance is a gas that's used to convert iron to steel. Okay, so whenever you want to convert iron to steel, you have to heat iron at very high temperatures in the presence of oxygen. Okay, so therefore, answer is oxygen. Okay, it's a greenhouse gas. So, uh, which of these is a greenhouse gas? Of course, that's a very obvious answer. It's just carbon dioxide. Okay. The gas that's approximately 78% of clean dry air. So the main, the biggest part of air is actually nitrogen. Okay, so therefore your answer is nitrogen. It's a form of carbon. So in a IGCSE, you learn there's two forms of carbon of like large carbon compounds. One is diamond and one is graphite, right? So which of these two is in the list? There's only one, which is diamond. So therefore your answer is diamond. That's it for question one. Okay, we'll move on to question two. So, question two, atoms are made of protons, neutrons, and electrons. Atoms are the same element as known as isotopes. Okay, so an isotope have uh, a two, two, two atoms with the same proton number. Proton number is same, but neutron number is, but, uh, sorry, mass number is different. So therefore, that's what an isotope is, okay? Complete the table. So, they give you the three subatomic particles. You have an electron, neutron, and proton. The relative charge of an electron has to be the direct opposite of a proton. So, proton is plus one, electron has to be negative one, okay? They already gave you the mass of an electron. It's one over 1840, okay? Now, for neutron, is a, the relative charge of a neutron is zero. So that's why you have the uh, isotopes. This is because neutrons are zero relative charge. They is the isotopes are able to occur. Okay, so the relative mass of a neutron is one, and the relative mass of a proton is also one. Okay. So here you have two atoms of magnesium. One is mass number twenty four and one mass number twenty five. Okay. Complete the table to show number of electrons, neutrons, protons in these isotopes of magnesium. Okay. So, firstly, the easiest one, we can write the number of protons, okay? So, the bottom number will always be the number of protons. So, number of protons is 12, okay? And we see that both of these magnesium are not ions. So, therefore, the number of electrons has to be equal to the number of protons. So, the answer will also be 12. Okay, as for number of neutrons, you just take the mass number, which is, in this case, 24, Minus 12, you get 12. So therefore, for for this, 
atom of magnesium, the number of neutrons has to be 12. But in this case, it's 25. So 25 minus 12 equals 13. So therefore, number of neutrons in this isotope of magnesium is 13. Okay? Explain why magnesium ions have a charge of 2 plus. So if you look at this table, back again, this table, you see that the proton has a plus charge, but electron has a minus charge. Okay? So why would magnesium ion have a charge of 2 plus? It is because there's more protons than electrons. To be more specific, there's, the, there's two more protons. Okay? To be more specific, there's two more protons than electrons. Okay? So, okay, now we can go question B. Magnesium 2 plus ions have the electronic structure of 2, 8. Give the formula of the following particles with the same electronic structure as Mg2 plus ion. So a cat ion, a positive ion. Uh, okay. So Mg2 plus is also a cat ion. It's in group 2, right? Group 2. Okay. So if it has a structure of 2A, which it would mean that it is the structure of a noble gas, which is neon. Okay. So what uh, what cation will have the same electronic structure as Mg2+, which is Ma+, is one example. Or, you can also write Al3+, okay? So next, an anion, a negative ion. So, for a negative ion, as the same electronic structure as 2A can be F minus O2 minus. Okay. And finally, for an atom, it's a. I already wrote here, it will be neon. So N E. Okay. So all of these will have the structure, electronic structure of 2A. So in the, the first shell, we'll have two electrons. In the outer shell, we'll have eight electrons. So all of these compounds would have this electronic structure, okay? Sorry, not compounds. Atoms. Or ions, I should say. Okay? Question 3. This question is about sodium and compounds of sodium. Okay? Describe the bonding in a metallic element such as sodium. So, this is looking at metallic bonding. So the first thing you should do if you want to draw a diagram is you have to draw a bunch of big circles. So this represents the positive cations of sodium. Okay, so this will all be the sodium cations, the Na plus, and then you would have a bunch of electrons surrounding the cation. So you will have to say uh, sodium positive. Ions surrounded by a C by a C of delocalized electrons. Okay, so therefore when you have a negative charge and a positive charge, they'll be attracted by electrostatic attraction, okay? So, the important part is, you have to say that it's a sodium cation surrounded by a sea of delocalized electrons attracted by electrostatic attraction, okay? So, describe how solid sodium conducts electricity. You have, since you have a sea of delocalized electrons, it means you have free moving electrons, okay? In order for a substance to conduct electricity, it has to have electrons or ions that are free moving. Okay? So, question 3b. Some properties of sodium chloride are shown. Melting point 801, non conductor electricity when solid, conductor of electricity when molten, and is soluble in water. So, name the type of bonding in sodium chloride. Okay? So, sodium chloride is a salt, right? So, sodium is a group 1, it's being mixed with a group 7, which is chlorine. Okay? 
So whenever you have a group 1 with a group 7 and they form a salt, the bonding has to be ionic. Because in group 1, they have one electron in their outer shell or their valence shell and they have uh, in group 7, they have 7 electrons in their valence shell. So therefore, if everyone wants to be happy, uh, the sodium will actually give one of its electrons to the chlorine and that's how an ionic bond is formed. Okay? So, the type of bonding will be ionic bonding. Explain why sodium chloride conducts electricity when molten. Because uh, they are freely moving ions. Okay, it's much like this question where they have freely moving electrons, but in this case, it's freely moving ions. Okay. Okay. So, C. A student determines the concentration of solution of dilute sulfuric acid by titration with aqueous sodium hydroxide NaOH. And they follow these steps. Step 1. Transfer into conical flask. 3 drops of meter orange. Burette is filled with H2SO4. As seen, the burette is added to conical flask until the indicator changes color. Titration is repeated several times until a suitable number, suitable number of results is obtained. So, CI. Name the piece of apparatus used to measure exactly 25 cm cube of 0.2 mole per dm cube of NaOH in step 1. Okay, whenever you have to measure exactly, sorry, whenever you have to measure exactly 25 cm cube of something as a liquid, you always have to use a pipette. Okay, you cannot use a measuring cylinder, and you cannot use a burette, because the most accurate would be a pipette. You can also use a pipette to measure 10 cm cube. Okay, so. I, I state the color change of the meter orange indicator in step 4. Okay, so if we look at this, three drops of meter orange indicators added to a conical flask, and the conical flask has NaOH. So, in uh, alkaline conditions, the meter orange would be yellow. Okay, and as you add more H2SO4 and as it neutralizes the solution, it will turn orange. Okay, for question 3. State how the student decides that a suitable number, suitable number of results have been obtained. So, how would they know is... How would they decide it? So this is a question on reliability, right? So, if they get answers close enough to each other, then they will only decide that a suitable number of results have been obtained. So, you have to write at least two of the results are 0 0.2 cm cube or less from each other. Okay? So the difference between two of the at least two of the results have to be very small, 0 0.2 cm cube from each other. So this is how you prove that the test is reliable, okay? And it's how the student decide that the suitable number of results has been obtained, okay? For C4, 20 cm cube of H2SO4 reacts to 25 cm cube of 0.2 mole per dm cube of NaOH. So this looks like a stoichiometry question. It has to do with moles, okay? So remember, one mole is just a certain number of atoms, okay, is a Avogadro's constant number of atoms, okay. So a mole is just a way of counting things, okay. So calculate the concentration of H2SO4 using the following steps. Calculate the number of moles in 25 cm cube or 0 0.2 mole per dm cube NaOH. Okay. So first step, you have to use the mole concentration and volume formula. So if you see here concentration is 0 0.2, so concentration equals the mole over the volume. Okay, so in this case you have the concentration which is 0 0.2 mole per dm cube equals the mole over the volume which is 25 cm cube. But this 25 cm cube you have to divide by a thousand because it's in cm cube but this is in dm cube. 
So it will be 25 over 1000. Okay. And therefore, if you do 0 0.2 times 25 over 1000 equals 0, 0 0.005 moles. Okay. So the answer will be 0 0.005 here. So determine the number of moles of H2SO4 that react with NaOH. So this is step two. This is where you utilize the balance equation. Okay. So over here, you use 0 0.05 moles of NaOH. So if 0 0.05 moles of NaOH is added, and two moles of NaOH reacts with one mole of H2SO4, 0 okay. 0 0.005 moles NaOH one mole. reacts with two moles and AOH. So therefore, if you have 0 0.005 moles of NaOH, your rank is 0 0.005 moles divided by two because number of NaOH, the moles of NaOH is twice the mole of H2SO4. So if you find the moles of H2SO4, you'll be 0 0.005 divided by two equals 0 0.0025. Okay, so that will be your answer. Finally, calculate the concentration of H2SO4. So, you can use this formula here again. So, to find concentration this time, concentration equals the mole 0 0.0025 divided by the volume. So, the volume in this case is 20 cm cube here. So, 20 divided by 1000 again because you want it in dm cube, not cm cube. So, therefore, the answer would be 0 0.125 mole per dm cube. Okay. Done. Question 4. This question is about compounds of sulfur. Sulfuric acid H2SO4 is manufactured during using the contact process. Okay. This manufacture involves four stages. So you know the contact process is uh, in the topic of equilibrium. Remember, in, the, in this topic, you learn about the contact process and you also learn about harbor process. Okay, so this, this question is talking about the contact process. Write a chemical equation for the reaction occurring in stage 1. So let's see stage 1. Molten sulfur burns in air to produce sulfur dioxide. So molten sulfur, just sulfur, burns in air. So when you burn something in air, you react with oxygen in the air to form sulfur dioxide. That's it. Okay. Question two. State the essential conditions that are necessary for stage two. Write an equation for the chemical reaction that occurs. So, sulfur di dioxide reacts with oxygen to form sulfur trioxide. So this one is the one where you have to remember the conditions, right? So what would the conditions be? The conditions would be 450 degrees Celsius. Two atmospheres of pressure, and you will finally need a catalyst. Right? What's the catalyst? Vanadium five oxide. Okay. And so after you stated the essential conditions, so each of these is one mark. So one is one mark. Is one mark. Is one mark. And then you write the equation, which is the final mark. So therefore, you have SO2 plus O2. Remember, it's equilibrium. So you have the reversible reaction, SO3. Okay. Then you need to balance this. You get 2 and 2 here. Okay. So this is the answer. Question 4, II. Now for III, write a chemical equation for the reaction occurring in stage 3. Okay. So when you have sulfur trioxide, how do you get oleum from sulfur trioxide? You have to add H2SO4, okay? And this will form oleum. Okay, very simple. So how do you get uh how do you get sulfuric acid back from oleum? 
you have to add water okay sorry you don't have to write the equation for this one you just get you have to add water the answer will be water okay for b hydrogen sulfide has a formula h2s complete the dot and cross diagram to show only the electron arrangement in the molecule hydrogen sulfide outer shell electrons only okay so hydrogen each hydrogen atom has one electron okay and let's see if we scroll down to the periodic table sulfur is in group six okay so therefore it has six electrons in its outer shell okay so if you want to draw an, uh, the, the form the dot and cross diagram of h2s Firstly, you need to draw the bonds. So let's say the hydrogen is the X and the sulfur is the circle. So the sulfur will donate one electron to form this bond and donate another electron to form this bond. I'm not really donate, share because it's covalently bonded. So you will share one electron with hydrogen here and one electron with hydrogen here. And then it still has four more electrons that are unbonded. So to draw two lone pairs so sulfur there will be one two three four five six sulfur is in group six so that's correct hydrogen is in group one uh, hydrogen has one electron and there's only one x for each hydrogen so therefore is the answer okay balance the chemical equation for the reaction of hydrogen sulfide with sulfur dioxide shown so very simply very simple they already standardized the SO2 so what else is standardized the oxygen right so if you have two oxygen here therefore you have to have two oxygen on this side of the equation as well right and the only compound that's oxygen is water so therefore you need to have two water to account for the oxygen on the left side so oxygen is balanced so therefore you have two oxygen on each side so now since you have two water molecules you will have four hydrogen molecules so since you have four hydrogen molecules here also has to have four hydrogen molecules, so that will be two. Okay. And finally, you have to count the number of sulfur molecules. Okay. You have two sulfur on this, on this, on this molecule, and then you have one more here. So therefore, the answer is two H2S plus SO2 arrow three S plus H two H two O. Okay. Next, ethanoic acid is manufactured by the reaction of methanol with carbon monoxide. An equilibrium mixture is produced. State two characteristics of an equilibrium. So, whenever you're talking about equilibrium, you need to remember the rate of forwards and backwards reactions are the same. And you also need to know that the concentration of reactants and products are the same. Okay? It's the two things. Okay? The purpose of the industrial process is to produce a high yield of ethanoic acid at a high rate of reaction. The manufacture is carried out at a temperature of 300 degrees Celsius. The forward reaction is exothermic. Use this information to state why the manufacture is not carried out at temperatures below 300 degrees Celsius. So the question tells you that the forward reaction is exothermic. Okay, so exothermic means the environment will increase in temperature, right? So if you were to increase, so if you were to decrease the temperature manually using Le Chatelier's principle, you will expect more product to be formed. However, you don't want to do this is because the rate will be too low. Of course, the lower temperature will be better, but if the temperature is too low, the molecules have less energy to collide with each other and therefore the rate of the reaction will be slower. Okay? 
above 300 degrees, it goes, it favors the reverse reaction more than the forward reaction. Because when you increase the temperature, the system wants to decrease the temperature. So therefore, it will favor the backwards reaction. So if you increase the temperature above 300 degrees Celsius, the rate of reaction may be faster. However, you will have less yield of ethanoic acid. Okay. So question C. Complete the table using only the words increase, decreases, or no change. So when you add a catalyst, the f why would you, why do you want to add a catalyst to a reaction? Is to increase the rate of reaction. Okay. And then uh, dec when you decrease the temperature. What effect does this have on the rate of whole reaction? Once again, you have to use Le Chatelier's principle. When you decrease the pressure, it favors the left side, the reactants, because the reactants have more molecules than the products. So the products have one molecule, but the reactant have two molecules. So when you decrease the pressure, the system wants to increase the pressure. So how would they increase the pressure? By adding more molecules. Huh? So if you decrease the pressure, the effect on the rate of flow reaction will decrease because you would favor the reverse reaction. And what effect does decreasing the pressure have on the equilibri equilibrium yield of CH3COOH? Therefore, it would decrease. Okay. Yeah. Next. B. Suggest which of the following metals is a suitable catalyst for the reaction. The answer would be. So if you look at all of this, one of the one of these metals is different from the rest, and that would be cobalt. Because cobalt is the only transition element among all of these. Uh, among all of these metals, okay. So remember, transition elements most of the time acts as good catalysts for most reactions, okay. Next, ethanoic acid is a member of the homologous series of carboxylic acid. State the general formula of this homologous series. So you have to remember, general formula for carboxylic acids has to be C and H two and plus one COOH, okay. Draw the structure of the carboxylic acid containing three carbon atoms. Show all the atoms and all the bonds, okay? All of the bonds and all of the atoms, okay? Carboxylic acid with three carbon atoms. So first, you have to draw three carbon atoms. One, two, three. Then you have to draw the carboxylic acid group, which is C, O, O, H, okay? You have to draw this bond because they ask you to show all of the bonds, okay? Then you just fill in the hydrogens. So this compound will actually be propanoic acid. You don't have to write this down. I'm just telling you that since it's three carbon and it's an acid, it has to be propanoic acid. Okay. Now for G, when carboxylic acids react with alcohols, esters are produced. The formula of ester X is CH3, CH2, CH2, COO, CH3. So name ester X. So all esters have an ester group. And whenever you're forming an ester, you need a carboxylic acid and an alcohol, right? So how would you name this ester? Remember, when you name esters, it will be something ill and something O8. Okay? So if I were to draw ester X, it will look something like So, so this is what ester X will look like, okay? So how would you name this? Firstly, you have to cut you have to cut the ester at this part. Okay? You have to cut the ester at this part because this is where the carboxylic acid and the alcohol form the bond. So you have to cut it on this bond 
and then you now separate it into the carboxylic acid and the alcohol. So the alcohol section only has one carbon. So therefore, it will be methyl. So meth means one carbon. And the carboxylic acid part has one, two, three, four carbons. So it will be methyl butanoate. Why butanoate? Because if you're following this naming process, the O8 has to come from the carboxylic acid and the ale has to come from the alcohol. So if the carboxylic acid has four carbon, it will be butanoate. Because but means four. Alcohol only has one carbon, so meth methyl butanoate is ester X. Okay? Give the name of the carboxylic acid and the alcohol that react together to produce a ester X. So if you know how to name ester X, this should be pretty easy. It will be butanoic. It and it will be methanol. Okay, very easy. Now H, ester Y has the following composition by mass. Calculate the empirical formula of ester Y. Okay, so the easiest way to do this is actually to draw a table. Okay, so you will have carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Since they give you a percentage, you can just say uh, 48.65 out of 100 grams is carbon and vice versa for hydrogen and oxygen, right? So, first step you want to do is take 48.65, 8.11, 43.42, 43.42, 43.42. If you want to divide by their MR, so this will be 12, this will be 1. This would be 16. Why do you want to divide by MR? Because you're using the mass. The mole. If you're using this formula, if you divide the mass by the MR, you get the mole. And if you want to find empirical formula, you have to find the mole, the smallest mole, okay? So, uh, if you divide it, oh, sorry. If you divide everything, you will get. Be 8.11. This would be 4.05. And lastly, this would be 2.70. Okay. So this is your first step. So after that you complete the first step, what you want to do is divide these three numbers by the smallest of these three numbers. So out of 4.05, 8.11, and 2.70. The smallest number will be 2.70. Make sense? So 2.70 divided by 2.70 equals 1. Okay. And 8.11 divide by 2.70. Let me just do that real quick. You get 3. And lastly, you have 4.05 divided by 2.70. You get 1.5. Okay, so this is the ratio of carbon to hydrogen to oxygen. So for every 1.5 carbon atoms, you have 3 hydrogen atoms and you will have 1 oxygen atom. However, this is not the final answer because you have to make everything a whole number. So if you times everything by 2, it would be 3, 6, 2. So now everything is whole number. And therefore, this is the empirical formula. So answer would be C3H6O2. Okay? The empirical formula. Ester Z has the empirical formula C2H4O and a relative molecular mass of 88. Determine the molecular formula of Ester Z. Okay? So this is very easy. It's only one mark. So if you add the MR of this if you find the MR of this uh, molecule, 
you will get 12 plus 12 plus 4 plus 16, which is 20, 30, 40, 44. Get 44. Okay, so the MR of C2H4O equals 44. So if a compound has a mass of 88, from 44 to 88, you need to times 2. Okay, so if C2H4O has 44 MR, therefore C4H8O2 must have 88, must have MR 88. Okay, therefore the answer has to be C4H8O2. Question 6. This question is about zinc and its compounds. Zinc is extracted from its ore, which is mainly zinc sulfide, zinc ZNS. Steps for this extraction are shown. Name the ore of zinc, which is mainly zinc sulfide. Okay, this one just need to remember. The answer is zinc blend. Okay. Describe how zinc sulfide is converted to zinc oxide. Very easy. You just basically just heat zinc sulfide strongly in air. Name the reducing agent used in step 2. Okay, so zinc oxide is reduced to zinc in a furnace. Zinc is formed to become a gas. So if you remember uh, this whole extraction process, the reducing agent is actually carbon. Okay. Explain why the zinc forms a gas in step 2 inside a furnace. It's because zinc form becomes a gas because the temperature of inside temperature inside furnace is higher than the boiling point of zinc so therefore it turns into a gas state the name of the physical change occurring when zinc gas is converted into molten zinc okay so from gas to liquid from gas to a liquid would it be called Condensation. Okay, B. Zinc sulfate crystals are hydrated. Zinc sulfate crystals are made by reacting zinc carbonate with dilute sulfuric acid. The equation for the overall process is shown. In step 1, zinc carbonate is in excess when no more zinc carbonate dissolves. State one other observation that indicates the zinc carbonate is in excess in step 1. So how would you know if you added something in excess. Basically, uh, since you release CO2 here, the answer will be no effervescence. Because you've already reacted all the H2SO4, so if you add more zinc carbonate, there's no point. You won't react. So there won't, there won't be any more CO2 release, so therefore no effervescence of CO2. You can also say no fizzing. Okay. Name a different substance other than zinc carbonate that can be added to dilute sulfuric acid to produce aqueous zinc sulfate. So you can add, uh, if you want to do a neutralization reaction, you can add zinc hydroxide. If you have zinc hydroxide and sulfuric acid, you react to form zinc sulfate and water. Step 1 is repeated using powdered zinc carbonate instead of large pieces. All other conditions are kept the same, the rate of reaction increases. Give a reason why the rate of reaction increases. So, whenever you decrease, whenever you're uh, comparing something in powdered form versus in large pieces, the powdered form will have a larger surface area. Okay? In powdered form. So, what does this mean? How does this increase the rate of the reaction? Because more uh, molecules exposed to H2SO4. So therefore, when there's more molecules exposed, so more collisions can occur, which increases the rate. Okay. So guess what is observed when a solution is saturated in step 3? Okay. So when you have a saturated solution and it starts to cool, you actually start to see crystals. 
form. Okay. And lastly, the formula for zinc sulfate crystals is ZnSO4 dot 7H2O. Give the formula of the solid form if the crystals are heated to dryness in step 3. Okay. So whenever you dry a hydrated compound, by the way, the dot means hydrated. Okay. So if you have a dot, that means the compound is hydrated. So whenever you have a hydrated compound, you're drying the hydrated compound, you will just get the original compound back. Huh? So you, the answer will just be ZnH, ZnSO4. You just remove the water. Okay. And finally, question 7. The periodic table can be used to classify elements. A. Group 1 elements react with cold water to form alkaline solutions. Place group 1 elements, cesium, lithium, potassium, rubidium, sodium, in their order of reactivity in water. Most reactive element first. Okay. So going down group one, going down, reactivity increases. Okay, so if you look at the periodic table, you just you'll see the most reactive is cesium, followed by rubidium, followed by potassium, and then sodium, and finally lithium. Name the alkaline solution form when cesium reacts with cold water. So, very simply, whenever you put a group 1 metal in water, you will get the metal hydroxide. So this one will be cesium hydroxide. Okay, Group 1 elements have lower melting points than transition elements. Describe one other difference in the physical properties of group 1 elements and transition elements. So, transition elements are your... It's basically what you think of when you think of a metal. It's hard. Transition elements are hard. They're metallic. Metallic uh, color. Yes, gray, silver. And then they have they are sonorous. They're high density. Okay. So basically, group one elements are very squishy and soft. So you can write for one physical property that differs. You can say that group 1 elements have low density or they are not as strong or they are soft. Okay. Group 7 elements are known as halogens. Astatine is below iodine in group 7. So predict the physical state of astatine at room temperature and pressure. So at the top of group 7 you have fluorine and then you have chlorine, bromine, Iodine and then astatine. Okay, astatine. So towards the top, these two are gases. Bromine is a liquid. Iodine is a solid. So if you see there's a trend, as you go down group 7, the state goes from gas to a solid. So since astatine is below iodine, astatine would be a solid at room temperature. D. Some group 7 elements react with aqueous solutions containing halide ions. And when aqueous chlorine is added to aqueous potassium bromide, a reaction occurs. Half equations are shown. Describe the color change of the solution. So, the original color of potassium bromide solution is colorless. Why colorless? Because now the ions are... You, you, there's no uh, element that's there that brings color. Okay. There's only the compound potassium bromide, which is in the solution is colorless. So whenever the reaction occurs, as you see here, the bromine loses electrons to form the bromide ions loses electrons to form bromine. So therefore, bromine will be formed, and therefore bromine is actually brown. So once the reaction occurs, the bromine gas will be uh, uh, bromine would the bromine would dissolve in, in the aqueous solution and therefore the solution would be brown since bromine is brown. Okay. Identify the species that is oxidized. Okay. So if you remember oil rig is a, a acronym that I use. If you remember oxidation is loss of electrons, reduction is gain in electrons okay 
So the species oxidized would be bromide ions. Br minus. Why? Because the bromide ions loses electrons to form bromine. Okay. E. Bromine monochloride. BrCl is made of the reaction between bromine and chlorine. The chemical equation is shown. Br2 gas plus Cl2 gas, BrCl. Okay. Calculate the overall energy change for the reaction using bond energies using the following steps. So, first step, they ask you to calculate the total amount of energy required to break the bond in one mole of Br2 and one mole of Cl2. So, first step, you need to calculate one mole of Br2 and one mole of Cl2. So, in Br2, the only bond you have is this bond, BrBr. And then in Cl2, the only other bond you have is the Cl-Cl bond. So if you add these two together, you get uh, 4, 3, 2. Okay? You get 4, 3, 2. Okay. okay? So you just add these two together, you get the total bond energy of the reactants. So next, calculate the total amount of energy released when bonds in two moles of BrCl are formed. So BrCl in here, the only bond present in one molecule of BrCl is this BrCl, the bond in the middle. And each bond has a bond energy of 218. But you have two molecules of BrCl. So We'll have to 2 times 218, okay? So this equals to 436. Okay. Uh, kilojoules. Calculate the overall energy change for the reaction. So, how do you calculate energy change? You just take the products minus the reactions, the reactant, okay? So in this case, the product is 436. Minus 432 okay. equals uh, 4. Okay, so uh, first off, the difference between these two is 4. So to find the delta H is uh, H product minus H reactant. Okay, so after you find this difference, you need to state whether it's exothermic or endothermic. In this case, the energy required to break the bonds, which is the energy you're taking in, is less than the energy you release. So taking is less than release. So therefore, the net, so which equals a net release into the environment. So when you release energy into the environment, the temperature of the environment will increase. When the, when the temperature of the environment increases, you have an exothermic reaction. So, it will be, instead of 4, it will be negative 4. Okay? So, the answer will be negative 4 kilojoule per mole. In this case, you don't need to divide by 1 mole of anything because you already calculated the bond energy in 1 mole of Br2 and 1 mole of Cl2. If you calculate it in 2 moles, you have to divide the n difference by 2. But in this case, you don't have to. So the answer is just negative 4 kilojoules per mole. And that's it for this paper. See you next time.